Hi y'all, welcome back. Here we are for Module 7. This is American Sport Goes Global. We'll be pulling from GEMS Chapter 10 and Wiggins Chapters 16 and 17. The crux of this lecture is going to surround this argument as sport as big business. We're going to consider the time frame from approximately 1980 to 2000. Becomes very clear throughout this time frame, again roughly 1980 to 2000, that sport is business, and managing sport is like running a corporation. Sport is quantified, it's commercialized, and it's male-dominated. Governing bodies play an important role in this notion of managing the NCAA, the professional leagues, and the International Olympic Committee ultimately dictate rules and behavior. TV and internet has been a key factor in turning sport into a business. Networks are devoted strictly to sport. ESPN is a household name. The marketing of players and or teams nationally and internationally becomes more commonplace in this time. Finally, we know that sport is a business because sport agents represent the financial interests of players and coaches. No longer our coach. It becomes evident throughout this time frame, again roughly 1980 to 2000, that sport is turning into a business and managing sport is like running a corporation. Sport is quantified, it's commercialized, and it's male dominated. Governing bodies are in place to make sure that sport operates in an efficient manner. The NCAA, the professional leagues, as well as the International Olympic Committee dictate rules and behaviors. TV and internet also has added to this notion of sport as business. We have networks throughout this time that become household names as they are solely devoted to sport, like ESPN. The marketing of teams and players is on the rise, especially to global markets. Also, throughout this time, we see the rise of the influence of sporting agents as they represent the financial interests of coaches and players. Because sport is now a business and managing sport is like running a corporation, we have a new goal of sport. It's to maximize profits. And there are a couple of ways that sport organizations have found that they can maximize profits. One is through televised sport. We have changed the way we televise games. For example, instant replay, night games, the innovations in the way we play games, and global stars have all been ways that TV has increased the earning potential for sport. In addition, Owners and teams have pushed for the construction or reconstruction of stadiums. And in doing this, these teams and owners have oftentimes put the onus of this stadium construction on public funding. One of the ways that stadiums have resulted in the ability to increase profits is how they've been designed. Luxury boxes, seat license, and naming rights of sponsors are all ways that stadiums add to the bottom dollar. With the rise of sport as big business also came the rise of sport as tourism. These kind of invented traditions drove fans to see such things as the Hall of Fame, nostalgic parks and venues, and in doing this uh, one of the results was that our mega events became highly commercialized to draw in large influx of fans. Super Bowl and Olympics are just to name a few. A few excuse me. One of the problems with this notion of sport as tourism is that the money that goes into these tourist activities, like potentially the Super Bowl or the Olympics, that money rarely trickles down to non-sport ventures in the community. This has been a point of contention for communities that bid for these large-scale sporting events like the Super Bowl and the Olympics. This notion of sport as tourism became very evident in the commercialization of the Olympics. 
There were a couple of very important things that happened in American sport history throughout this 1980 to 2000 Indian Olympics. One of those was the miracle on ice. We now know it as a major motion picture, but at this time, the miracle on ice was re temporary relief for turmoil in world events. There were boycotts to the 1980 and 84 Olympics won by us and ultimately in 84 by other countries. The 1984 LA Olympics proved to be profitable. The US or LA generated more than 200 million on this event. What did this do? It influenced future bids. There was a realization that hosting the Olympics could be profitable. Therefore, the, Oly the Olympic Committee imposed Western values in regulating the Olympic movement. Since sport was becoming such big business, a number of the professional leagues underwent some changes throughout this time. Baseball was one of them. They sought to bring baseball back to its form as the great America pastime. So what did it do? It underwent a couple structural changes. This included wild cards and interleague play. Also, it marketed the 1998 home run chase between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. One of the ways it was able to keep costs down is that Major League Baseball has went to and it now depends upon the growth of those cheaper Latin American players. In keeping step with other professional leagues, the NBA began to look at global markets. How did it do so? First, it began to focus its attention on key individual athletes within those teams. Bird versus Magic was a common matchup that drove ratings. David Stern, the NBA commissioner, had a strong business acumen. He drove the NBA to consider those overseas markets. Michael Jordan is probably the greatest thing to happen to the NBA. His likeness, his products, and his performance transcended the NBA and ultimately global markets. Let's talk a little bit more about Michael Jordan. His sporting heroics defined the 1990s. He's known for his artistic play and his telegenic moves. That is, he was highly marketable. He became a global icon. He was involved in a couple of key marketing campaigns, the Be Like Mike campaign. I grew up singing that little jingle, I wanna be, wanna be, wanna be like Mike. He also was part of Space Jam, and maybe most importantly, his brand emerges. The iconic Michael Jordan image all over his shoes became increasingly popular, popular in the U.S. and also was a global icon. Similar to the professional leagues, college sport and the NCAA tried to keep step with this notion of sport as big business. For many, the amateur ideal was questioned and mocked. That is, many came to question whether college athletes were really and truly amateurs. As we've seen in previous historical events, scandal continued to rock college sport. This is where SMU got the death penalty. A really interesting lawsuit and outcome was in 1985. The University of Oklahoma and the University of Georgia sued the NCAA. The result was that individual schools were now able to negotiate their own TV contracts. What did this mean? Individual institutions could now receive or reap the great rewards of putting NCAA sports, mainly football, on TV. Lastly, maybe one of the best decisions the NCAA did in terms of making sport a business is that they expanded the size and the scope of the NCAA basketball tournament throughout this time frame. Several key female athletes and the performances of these female athletes shattered sporting myths surrounding women from this time frame of roughly 1980 to 2000. They were a couple key female Olympic heroes, Mary Lou Retton, Florence Griffith Joyner, or Flojo, Jackie Joyner-Kersey, and John Benoit. These women 
made steps that ultimately shattered the myths surrounding the frailties of a woman's body. Another key figure throughout this time was Nancy Lieberman Klein. She was key in promoting opportunities for female athletes in various roles, including coach, athlete, and TV analysis. TV analyst, excuse me. Women's teams also gathered fame throughout this time. Maybe the most prominent came in 1999 when the women's national soccer team won the World Cup at the Rose Bowl. At that time, it was the largest female sporting event of its kind. As female athletic performances rose, so did questions regarding gender and sexuality. With the increase of the tea of TV and the internet, athletes' lives were more scrutinized, including their sexuality. There was a tension between whether recognition should be on beautiful female bodies or their athletic achievements. Anna Kornikova is arguably one of the greatest examples of this. Also throughout this time frame of roughly 1980 to 2000, Martina Navratilova was a key tennis player in this era. However, she was a symbol of athletic power, but she didn't necessarily subscribe to traditional feminine ideals. The media pitted her against American Chris Everett, and they always had it that Everett was the feminine one and Navratilova was the mannish one. Ownby in Wiggins chapter 16 argues that sport has strong connections to what it means to be manly. Not only are we quick questioning a female's femininity, but sport helps us question and or maintain our traditional values of masculinity. This is seen in our history as well as in our present. As sport was a common place to ask questions about gender and sexuality, it also became a contested place to discuss homophobia. Greg Luganis and Martina Navratilova received acceptance. However, it was oftentimes begrudgingly. For male athletes and male teams, it wasn't always considered a safe space to come out like that of female sports. For example, David Cope and John Amici came out after their careers ended and former teammates ultimately distanced themselves from these athletes. This is an ongoing conversation. This notion surrounding sport, sexuality, and homophobia, while introduced roughly the 1980s to the 2000s, is still a common discussion today. Even though the number of black athletes had increased opportunities by 1980, racism was still going on in sport in the 20th century. One of the things that the text points out is that the world of sport is painfully slow to acknowledge that Black's intellectual inferiority was pseudoscience, or fake. That is, there were a number of myths that surrounded Black's outstanding physical abilities. For simplers, simplistic sake, Blacks were seen as natural athletes with no intellect. As we move forward, we'll see that that transition or that myth has began to reduce. It should also be noted that in this time frame, 1980 to roughly 2000, there were few opportunities for blacks as owners, GMs, and coaches. We have changed a few things, but as we'll see going forward, some of those opportunities still remain small. As the commercialization of sport rose, and as the ability to make profit from sport rose, so did a number of vices associated with sport. And one of those vices was PEDs, or performance enhancing drugs. Just a little background information. In 1935, German scientists isolated testosterone, which ultimately they found would help increase muscle mass and strength. This led to weightlifters, track and field athletes, swimmers, and football players taking these substances. Governing bodies ultimately banned performance enhancing drugs in 1975 and began to test athletes in various ways. In order to prevent a positive test, 
many athletes learned ways to avoid tests or mask results. In this time frame, one of the biggest scandals came when Ben Johnson was stripped of his 1998, excuse me, 1988 100-meter gold medal because of steroids. Also in this time frame, WADA, or the World Anti-Doping Agency, was formed in 1999 in response to what appeared to be rampant PED use in the 1998 Tour de France. USADA was started in 2000. That is the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. I think it's worthy to note that the widespread use of PEDs makes sense with the highly commercialization of sport. Athletes have realized that bigger, faster could yield bigger and faster performances. And PEDs was a way to do that. And ultimately these bigger, faster performances yielded big payouts. In addition to performance enhancing drug abuse, a number of high profile athletes were impacted by recreational drug use. Len Bias, Gordie Howe, Lawrence Taylor, Daryl Strawberry, and Dwight Gooden were a couple of high profile names that were all impacted by their addiction to cocaine. Bias, sadly, maybe the most famous, died from his overdose addiction to cocaine. The last vice we're going to talk about throughout this time frame is violence. At this time, from 1980 to about 2000, a couple of key research pieces came out indicating that after watching contact sport, fans were more violent or engaged in more violent behavior. Furthermore, the culture surrounding hockey, football, and boxing put intense pressure on their athletes to be violent. How did they do so? Athletes that were violent or overly violent were rewarded, whether in contracts, media coverage, or reputation. And I quote, the reinforcement of one's masculinity, especially in the presence of other males, is a big factor in winning group acceptance. That sense of identity has long been an essential socially constructed male desire. One of the arguments surrounding male sport and violence is that men use sport as a way to prove their masculinity. And how did they do so? They acted violently. Our last slide is going to consider sport, the individuality, and team icons. It's important to note that throughout this time frame, there were extreme player and team movements. That is, athletes were traded or went to play for opposing teams. In addition, we saw a number of professional teams pick up and move to other cities. In doing so, this made it incredibly difficult for fans to identify with these stars and ultimately be loyal to these teams. Uh, Nathan McDonald in Wiggins chapter 16 though take on this interesting discussion of Cal Ripken Jr. One of the reasons they argue that Cal Ripken Jr. was so famous throughout this time is that he embodied these kind of working class ideals. He was extremely dedicated, not only to the game of baseball, to its fans, by playing day in and day out. For many uh, fans throughout this time, he was a key figure to return them to what they knew. Also, it's important to note that the media encouraged and rewarded individualistic behavior. The text brings out this notion that Michael Jordan symbolized both the best and wor worst of American ambition and drive. Jordan, in all of his glory, not only was willing to be the best, at times he was willing to be the worst teammate in order to be the best. Also in this time frame, Neon Dion Sanders was highly marketed. This idea of an athlete that was willing to act flashy and individually was given credit by the media 
and given coverage. All right, we've made it to the end of module seven. Here are your questions for thought, using for fact checking, and application.